off. So my name is, you know, I might know is Claire Hayes and I'm clinical director with AWARE. And those of you who have been attending the AWARE webinars over the last year or so would know that we have monthly webinars. This is different. This is for AWARE Mental Health Week. So we have three webinars of this week, starting with the one today, and they go on for 30 minutes or so. So they're shorter than the monthly ones. And today's one is a conversation with Stephen McBride, who is Director of Services with AWARE, and is back to basics, recognising depression. Then on Wednesday, I'm going to be talking to or talking with Dr. Keith Gaynor, clinical psychologist. And those of you who have been following AWARE's work over the last number of years might be familiar with Keith as he's given several um, supports to AWARE, several lectures that are on the AWARE website. And then the final one on Friday is really the, the key and it's the we're keeping the best to last. And that's no disrespect to you, Stephen. Not that's, taken. That's depression and me, personal perspectives. And I will be talking to two people who have experienced depression in the past, who know what they're talking about and who are very willing to come forward to talk about it. And that's David and Brianna. And I encourage all of you to have a look at AWARE's website. This is a very special week for us. We're promoting, really helping people know what is depression and what can people do about it to support themselves and or to support others. So just looking at the, just checking I've covering everything. So the campaign is centered around really a wonderful group of ambassadors and they're all sharing their experiences of living with depression. This webinar today is part of it, but if you look at aware.ie Mental Health Week, you can see a lot of different resources. So that's the introduction. And Stephen, I'm just really delighted to have time with you. We've spoken to you before on the webinar series, but there've always been other people. Mm. So thank you for stepping in today. And if we look at back to basics, so a mm. key question that we're often asked is, what is depression? Mm. Yeah, and it is a key question, and I suppose anyone developing their own understanding and awareness of what they might be experiencing and the different thoughts they have about themselves and the different feelings they're experiencing and how that impacts on their behavior, you know, and having that question maybe in their heads about, am I depressed? Are these feelings I'm experiencing um, signs and symptoms of depression? And one of the acronyms that we're so proud of here in AWARE is our festival acronym, which uh, maybe sounds a little bit strange to say, what does festival have anything to do with depression? But really, uh, the idea in that uh, acronym, it's thinking about F for feelings, E for energy, S for sleeping, T for our, our thinking, uh, I for interest, V for the value we have in ourselves, A for aches and pains, which would be, you know, more um, kind of pronounced uh, than maybe the general aches and pains that uh, we all experience as, as the body gets a bit older. And L for life, you know, loss of interest in living. So I think that's a real tangible and kind of um, how to guide in relation to understanding the signs and symptoms of depression. Um, so that festival acronym is something that we, we really hold dear here in AWARE and, and you're very aware of it yourself. So it's something that I, I think allows people to recognize depression and get a sense of if you're experiencing five or more of those uh, signs and symptoms for a pr prolonged period of time, three weeks in towards a month, well, then that would be um, significant of uh, suggestive, should I say, of, of the experience of depression. And I know Dr. Pat McKeown, who founded AWARE um, mm. for Though for Though all those years ago in 1985, developed festival. And I used to think it was a, it was a strange word to think of in mm. terms of depression. But I don't anymore because I know the Samaritans, for instance, do outreach services at festivals. And we know that festivals can be an example of a time where people are expected to feel wonderful, to mm. feel great, to feel happy. And for someone who's experiencing depression at a festival, they might be doing their best to hide what's actually going on for them. And they might mm. be maybe relying on alcohol to keep them going or mm. their, their sleep mm -hmm. might be affected. So I, I love the word. I, I think it's really great. And it's an example of how that it's not just in the middle of winter, people might experience depression. It can be sure. in the middle of a summer festival or a winter. Sure. Yeah, this is it. Yeah. 
and I, and I think one of the big things just to tune into what you're saying, Claire, is, is that if, if in yourself, you know, we all have a relationship with ourselves or we engage in self-talk, you know, all the kind of private thoughts that we have about ourselves and about our experience in the world, you know, we're all unique human beings. So it's the sense of if you're questioning yourself, recognizing depression, I suppose, comes about by if you're having a nagging question in your head, I'm not feeling myself. I'm having um, unhelpful uh, thoughts about myself. I'm having unhelpful and difficult thoughts about how uh, my work life is going, whatever. And that if you're then the, how that can manifest in behavior is by not behaving, by bottling it up. And if that's coming into, into view over a period of time, as it said in the previous slide, two or three weeks in an ongoing way, then we would encourage people to reach out for support, whether that's in your private life with your loved ones and or more professionally with a GP uh, or ourselves here at AWARE. Yeah, and I forgot to mention, Stephen, that we have the question and answers box. So if anybody has specific questions, if you see me putting or when you see me putting on my glasses, it's for me to have a look at to read some of the questions. And um, this will be record is being recorded, so it'll be available on the website. So we're encouraging people, if they're not able to sign in for the next two webinars, on, one on Wednesday, one on Friday at midday, to email anyway so that they, they will get a an, um, notification from where and they can watch it back. So one of the questions that we get is in terms of, well, what can you do with depression? So I'm preempting that question by saying that's what we're going to be looking at on Wednesday. So today is very much teasing out. And my understanding of depression, I know when I was doing my training to be a clinical psychologist, was using very much a biopsychosocial model of depression. So there's a biological component or can be a biological component. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can be genetic or sometimes it can be a learned experience and learned um, Martin Seligman, Professor Martin Seligman in the States talks about learned helplessness. So mm -hmm. if a child, a young child, looks out the window when they, the parent is there or the adult is there saying, oh, it's, it's raining again. The child might pick up a kind of a more pessimistic outlook on life. Whereas if the adult is looking out saying, wow, it's raining, let's get wellies and splash in the puddles, that child is having a different experience. So mm -hmm. there's the biological piece, there's the psychological, which you mentioned in terms of all of our thoughts. And we can be really hard on ourselves. And mm -hmm. The, you've mentioned the festival. I also like the Beck Depression Inventory as a way of understanding what depression is. And mm -hmm. there are questions in that that are key in terms of a sense of being self-critical and also a sense of feeling worthless compared to other people. And then the social mm -hmm. aspect. So with depression, it can be very tempting and common for people to withdraw, to just consider, well, there's no point. I'm I'm not going to be good fun. I'm not going to enjoy it. I don't want to go out and to stay at home or to push themselves and then maybe to rely on something again like alcohol. And we know alcohol can be a mood depressant and can affect depression as well, as indeed can mm. caffeine. So when people say, what is depression? It's not just feeling down, as you've explained. It's all of these mm. aspects of life. So Stephen, from mm. your experience with AWARE and the different services that AWARE offer in terms of the helping people understand what depression is. So yes, they can go to the website and look up the festival, but are there other ways that people can know if they're, if they're worried about knowing what depression is? Yeah, sure. It's a very helpful question, Claire, in relation to thinking about what you can do, because here at AWARE, we provide both support and information. And the information aspect obviously can be taken from the website, you know, aware.ie, but also that can take the form of sending us an email uh, or also, you know, to ring our support line, you know, and all the details of that are on our website, you know, to, to tease that out, to be able to talk to a, a trained volunteer about some of the concerns or questions that you might have in your head to get a sense of actually what is going on for me. Because of that old adage that knowledge is power, that if you have an informed opinion from a trained volunteer in conversation, a person who will meet you where you're at, and by that I mean is just try to forge a connection with you so that you can uh, inform yourself about actually what might be going on for me in this regard, whether it is depression or something else. And in that conversation, uh, the volunteer will support you to, to get professional advice um, should you feel it would be beneficial to you. 
So really, it's coming back to that idea that the uh, support services that we do offer, uh, obviously, I, I, I also would like to mention, you know, the support groups that we offer as well, that they do provide support and information. And that aspect of your question, Claire, is around developing information about what might be going on for me to yeah. take the next steps so that you begin to emerge out of your own head and speak about it. Because that's the key aspect of it is to speak about what you think is going on for you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think a real key point for me is in terms of helping myself understand what depression is. And it can, mm. it can manifest differently for different people. So we can might think, you know, people talk about the black dog of depression, the black mm. cloud. And so certainly some people do experience that and, and um, come across as if they're experiencing that. But sometimes it's very difficult to know if someone else is experiencing depression because they might be looking as if they're the just heart and soul of the conversation. They're in great form all the time. They're mm -hmm. um, always positive. Mm -hmm. And we might not know or pick up unless we know them really, really well that actually that's not really what's going on for them. And then in their in the privacy of their own car or their own homes, mm -hmm. they might be um, different. So yeah. having an awareness of what depression is for us, what it means like, what it means. And people talk about the stigma of depression. Can, can mm -hmm. you talk about that, Stephen? What's your understanding of that? I think, yeah, my understanding of it kind of tunes into what you just said in relation to our public selves and our private selves, how we show ourselves to the world when we're uh, public, in public, you know, whether it's in our workplaces or whether it's, just uh, walking, you know, around around town, uh, for example, that we don't necessarily uh, show ourselves as we would, of course, in our private lives, within our families and within our friend networks. So the idea of a stigma comes from that, I think, in relation to if there's a too wide a gap between what we would be showing publicly and privately. And I suppose by that, I mean, it, it comes from the idea that if we're holding on or holding back, or bottling up what we're thinking or feeling, uh, whether that's as a, as a man or a woman, and predominantly, you know, men are socialized to cope or supposed to be able to cope and to, uh, to get on with things or are seen to be more logical or rational. And there is some truth in that, I would argue. And yet also, if we're not speaking, again, it's back to this idea of the invitation to talk, mm -hmm. however uh, briefly or not that might be, to destigmatize to say what's going on in your head to a, a, a trusted person. Now, obviously there's people out there in society that don't have, that maybe are lonely and or isolated and don't have a trusted person in their lives. So that's where the support services like ourselves or like a GP comes in. But stigma can be uh, held on very tightly to do with a sense of shame. What will the other person think of me if I am to say that I am feeling uh, down or I'm feeling depressed? Yet that's where the, the help comes from by saying it. And I would encourage and urge people as often and as um, you know, openly as possible to put words on that and to speak up as, as they can about their experience of, of how they think and feel about themselves. Absolutely. And you mentioned the word shame, and we know that shame can be a huge component of depression. Mm. Also, anger can be too. Mm. A good definition I find useful is anger turned inwards. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people can be really hard on themselves and that mm -hmm. can sometimes leak out as well um, in, in a kind of a moodiness or aggressive way. Another definition I find useful is a sense of hopelessness about mm -hmm. the self, the world, the future. And then Martin Seligman's learned helplessness. Mm -hmm. And then language, I think, is really important. And I know within AWARE, when, when I joined the board of AWARE years and years ago, people were talking about um, suffering depression. And certainly some people find it really, really, really difficult. And I know the language we use now is experience depression. And some people might not suffer from it, but they, they have it. And then they, whether people define themselves or we define ourselves as being depressed or mm. having depression. So language mm. is really important. Sure. And I'm just noticing, Stephen, so if you want to comment on that, we've got um, a few questions and mm -hmm. there was um, a comment from somebody and unfortunately he was finding it, um, wasn't able to see us, but I very much wanted to participate. So uh, I just see, can I get his back? And um, question here, 
Do you think unless a person has experienced depression in some way that it's difficult to understand what a person is going through? And this person says her personal experience is that she is quite depressed at the moment, but as she, oh, it's, it's, it really sums up what we were saying, as she gets up and puts her makeup on every day and goes into the public arena and fakes it all, that even when she does speak about her confide, she gets the comments from others, but you look great and you're out and what do you have to be depressed about? And she's just saying, um, it's, she ends up either saying nothing or saying too much and then she makes herself feel awful and then she has to cry to convince people she's not well and then many step away and stigmatize so gosh it really just mm. highlights how difficult it can be to experience depression and she's um so I suppose my, yeah, my, yeah, my response to that is to um say that i'm sorry to hear that this person's experience is one of not being heard or people being able to empathize with her uh, in, in her experience in the world. And, and it also sounds as though it's getting into a loop or a vicious cycle in relation to how uh, this person's behavior is manifesting and going around in a, in a circle or a cycle to do with the responses that, that she's receiving from colleagues or people in, in her world. Um, yeah, and it is, I'm, I'm, as I said, you know, it's difficult to hear that someone isn't being understood and upon reaching out verbally and to uttering, you know, the words that I'm not feeling uh, myself or I'm feeling low or down, that this isn't receiving the response that, that it needs to receive. Um, it's a very tricky situation to how do we get heard? And maybe it's not just about beating the drum over and over, but really um, how, how you kind of can think about the idea of, of sharing your experience to people that you can trust and then it, it, and then the idea of revealing too much to people in different scenarios where it, it mightn't be necessarily helpful. And I'd like to think that there is someone out there who we can have a, a helpful relationship with or who we can feel close to that we can trust in to confide in. Yeah. And, and that fits in, Stephen, with a with, um, comment I was looking for earlier, but it's come back on the screen. Somebody who's feeling alienated by the family and, and not understanding and not mm. sure if that person is overreacting. And, and I think... The, the common literature and, and what you're just saying as well is, you know, if somebody's experiencing depression to talk about it. I've always put a question mark on it, though, because I think it depends mm. on the quality of the conversation as well as who you talk to. Sure. So sure. If, if they're because if we're talking to loved ones, they might take it personally and they might think, well, what am I doing to make you feel like this? And then they might want to fix you. So then you feel better. So they'll feel better. So that's mm. why it's really great to use services like AWARES or to talk to the GP or to get professional support in the form of therapy or counselling. Mm. But also there's a sense of, they, I have a sense of the actual words that we use. So if we're going for a walk, for instance, and we know that going for a walk can be really helpful, to help us cope with depression. I'll be talking to Keith about this. But if we're going for a walk and we're thinking, oh, I should have done this long ago, or I'm just no good, or, and we're beating ourselves up. And if mm. we're talking to someone and we're beating ourselves up, that's not as helpful as saying, you know what, this is how I'm feeling. And this is what's going on for me. And mm -hmm. in, a, in a compassionate and a self-compassionate way. Mm. I think just to tune into what you're saying, you know, and, and you've mentioned it a little bit a, a time ago as well, Claire, is this idea of the internal critic and what we can do. The antidote to the internal critic is what we might do in our behavior and also in our self-talk, you know, being able to talk to ourselves in a kinder or more compassionate way that helps us to soothe ourselves from the, the difficulties and the events in our life. You know, we, we all experience adverse uh, life events. You know, no one gets away from that as being a human being. And what we do in that regard to try and uh, soothe ourselves or to, to calm ourselves, which kind of negates or moves us away from the idea of a maybe critical voice that says you should do better or you need to do more. So it's really coming to a place, as you say, of, of trying to find something more kind or compassionate in, in your head and also how you can find relationships that, if not are filled with kindness and compassion, but in a general sense that there's a sense of connection or kindness within them. Yeah. And there, there's a question. Thank you, Stephen. There's a, there's a question here from somebody saying, you know, how can they catch the symptoms of depression quicker? This person has a genetic and a lived experience of depression and finds it hard to ask for help. I remember attending a training years ago and Dr. Melanie Fennell was one of the key speakers and, and Melanie is one of the experts, international experts in this area. And I remember her saying, 
imagine you're someone who's had no experience of depression or anxiety and for no particular reason you wake up at four o'clock in the morning and you don't feel great Mm -hmm. what do you think how do you feel what do you do she's using very much your cognitive behavioral thoughts feelings actions framework and then she said now imagine you're someone who's had an experience a history of experiencing depression or anxiety over the years and you've been feeling good and for no particular reason you wake up in the morning and you don't feel great what do you think how do you feel what do you do and melanie's point was that in the second instance where people start thinking oh i can't get sick again or i don't feel well or i can't mm -hmm. be out of work or whatever those thoughts are that they in themselves are powerful enough to trigger a relapse. So in response to how can we catch the symptoms of depression quicker, I think the more we know ourselves, the more we realize that for me, if I'm going for, if I start thinking of a Twix bar, um, sugar, that's a warning sign for me that I might be experiencing stress. If someone's experiencing depression and they notice that they're cutting off people they care about, mm -hmm. they're withdrawing, they're retreating, they're just not doing what they have been doing, their activity is changing. And they have a lot of thoughts around not being good enough, useful, you, that they're useless. But then there are triggers in terms of, okay, maybe I'm slipping into depression again. And, and that's the key. Yeah. And I think the key note from that, Claire, and I, I totally uh, agree with you in that is early intervention. When you start noticing it, don't pretend it's not there. So I think it's very important when you notice one or two things kind of going a bit awry or moving away from how you have been or your uh, unhelpful uh, thoughts coming into the mix. And as you've said, you know, around the Twix bar, whatever it is for individuals, noticing it and then becoming aware of it and saying, hang on, I need to do something now, because the earlier you intervene on that, the, the better the likely outcome will be as you reach out for support, whether that's in your personal life or to do with uh, our own service here at AWARE or, or wherever you need to seek support from. So early intervention is a key note in that. Absolutely. And um, there, there's a question here from someone and um, the first time on with the So you're very welcome. I'm wanting to know what is depression. So um, depression explained is a complex thing. It affects our mood. It affects our thinking. It affects our behavior. And then she wants to know, is there a test that can be done to find out if you have depression? Well, I'd encourage you to talk to your GP. And as Stephen, you mentioned that this person might not have been there at the, at the early part of this. So to have a look at the festival, Ackman, it's on the website and there are a um, number of different areas that can, you can experience. And if you've experienced those over a two week period or longer, well, then mm. you may have depression, but depression is treatable. It's mm. manageable. So it's not about you are depressed. It's something that's part of your personality. That's it forevermore. It's something that could quite possibly be a logical response to whatever's going on in your life right now. Mm. And then there's somebody saying that they've been struggling with imposter syndrome lately and doubting capabilities, finding motivation difficult. So any tips for handling this? Again, that will be what we'll be talking to Keith about, but that would be very much part and parcel of depression, Stephen. What would you think? In in specifically in relation to imposter syndrome, Claire? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, the idea that, yeah, and, and I think some of the thinking that might go on in that regard is that I'm not good enough or I'm going to be found out. So really, if you try and uh, try and, and say to yourself, well, what's the counterpoint to that? You know, you know, so say it's, for example, you know, an imposter syndrome can often be manifested in, uh, in the workplace. It's the idea that um, am I able for this? And sometimes that that kind of thinking can fuel motivation. But on the flip side of it, if it's kind of uh, depleting motivation or it's leading you to question your capability, it's trying to put the evidence on the other side saying, well, here I am, I've got this behind me, I've done this, I've done that, whatever the evidence is, because sometimes we can deny the evidence around our accomplishments and achievements as well, which in, in turn kind of fuels some of the imposter syndrome or kind of make it bigger than, than it may need to be. You know, we all experience doubt and fragility in life. That goes with being a human. It's when it becomes kind of uh, developed and, and more, um, you know, prolific and, and debilitating where it needs to be checked, you know, around the thinking that's going on around it, I would, I would suggest. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've, I'm just, I'm listening to you, Stephen, but I'm also just conscious of, of we've sure. got lots of, lots of questions. Um, somebody talks about how talking about his mental health used to be embarrassing, and now he's very mm. happy to talk about it. Very and good. 
then it's, have we any advice on how to talk about it with friends and loved ones without seeming like an attention seeker? And I suppose that's for me, it's it's the not the labeling that um, comes back to well, why are we doing it? So if we're working to help other people, so it's not our identity, it's something we're experiencing. And on that, AWARE has the support, the um, well, uh, relatives and friends support mm. services and also the webinar. Um, mm. I think just to jump in there, Claire, you yeah, know, it's trying in relation to speaking to that, it's trying to use language that's most natural and that you're most comfortable with. Sure. And it's, it's not necessarily in the vein of using, um, you know, as, as plain and simple, keeping it simple is a very good adage to go by. And whatever language works for you in explaining how you're experiencing your mental health or how you're experiencing your mood, whether you have a diagnosis of depression or not, or whether you have a nag in your head, you know, about, say, for example, someone's on this webinar and tuning into the festival acronym and saying, yeah, that might be me. It's how you translate your understanding of that into your own language and try, trying or endeavoring to be open and free with that, with people in, in your life, you know, um, and, and how helpful that, that can be, you know. Yeah. Oh, Stephen, we have loads of questions and we're not going to be able to cover them all. So I encourage people to really follow what's going on with AWARE this week in particular that AWARE is Mental Health Week. So we have a webinar on Wednesday. We'd be talking to Dr. Keith Gaynor about what to do when somebody is experiencing depression and also how to support other people. And as we just said, the, we the webinar on supporting the supporter, that's available for people to look at. How do people know if they have depression? If they're concerned about it, talk to their GP. Also have a look at the festival. Um, what do people, under people's understanding of depression it's not just feeling down i'm just responding to a few questions come in it could be thoughts that we have it also might be mm. behavior so people being um grumpier or um snappier people maybe staying in bed longer less drinking alcohol sugar caffeine all of that and then there's a, a really lovely point from someone about how do we develop self-compassion when we're continuing to do stuff like that and you mentioned the word depleted stephen what happens when we have depression is we can have we can be just so exhausted so tired we it can be very very difficult to have the energy to get out and go for the walk or to meet up with friends mm. and this is where um i'm not a, a medical doctor so i can't comment on medication but this is where medication can have a role so again we'll be talking to keith about this on wednesday but encouraging people if they have questions about depression for themselves or someone else to really use this webinar as as um, a kick as a kickoff and someone's very keen on, on me asking about eliminating negative people which seems to be a new thing oh my goodness i i personally wouldn't like to label someone as positive and someone else as negative i mm. think we all have had components and oftentimes people who are making us feel however we feel can be our teachers can be children mm. as a wonderful buddhist monk what would you think on that stephen I I think the idea is, is that, you know, and, and, and obviously, you know, the relationships in, in, in life that, that we all have, you know, interpersonal and how we relate to the world, mm -hmm. you know, uh, interpersonally, you know, with family members, friends, etc. You know, the idea of eliminating someone is really bringing it back to yourself and saying to yourself, how can I exercise this choice? Can, can I say to myself that I have a choice over this and that I have a choice whether I am in a relationship with this person or not? Now, obviously, you know that in familial relationships, it's it's trickier because we maybe need to have an ongoing relationship with someone and the bonds or the attachment are, are different, you know, but it's the idea of how you look after yourself in the relationship. Or this is the idea that we won't deplete ourselves by creating. And this is a very important word, I think, in relationships is boundaries. So how boundaries can be created, you know, by not over revealing for example or trying to uh, create some psychological safety by looking after ourselves by, by saying to yourself i have a choice and if it starts from there i think some momentum can be built yes yes and wise words Stephen. and there's there's a question in terms of depression in the older person and is that different from the younger person i'd encourage you to have a look at one of the lectures that dr declan lyons gave for aware it's on the aware website and dr lyons is an expert in working with older people and he mm. explains that really really clearly 
And then there's um, a few comments in terms of people thinking that depression is attention seeking and worried about it. And again, choose a person. If the person you think is not going to be compassionate, well then, you know, choose, choose somebody else. Mm. And I am, um, Stephen, we could it's, go on and on and we on. Could, we could, we could. And just to that, just to that point, Claire, it's yeah. the idea of, you know, trusting in your own judgment of it. And if, if you're receiving uh, hostile remarks or commentary, that's, that's kind of get, getting in on you very naturally to do with it, it coming ne not necessarily from a helpful place. It's standing, standing your own ground or how you can develop a, a sense of solidity that you can stand your own ground and trust in your own judgment of yourself. Again, back to that word, I suppose, of boundary. I have a choice. Stephen, I'm conscious we're coming to the end, so I want to give okay. you an opportunity. Is there anything that I haven't asked you or given you the opportunity to say that you'd like to add in? Well, there's just one aspect of it, I, I suppose, is that um, I was thinking about the impact of depression on people's understanding, like the sense of purpose in their life or how they make meaning, you know, that, that the meaning that uh, we all have in, in our lives and how that can be developed. You know, as you say, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to become part of someone's identity and that it is treatable and that progress can be made so it's very much from that position that uh, we are fluid uh, human beings and that change can happen and it's in that spirit of encouraging people to think about how they might be able to grow and develop um, is, is, is the last message I would like to uh, put out in the webinar. Yeah, I like that. And that links with what I was actually going to say a few moments ago about Pema Chodron. She's an American Buddhist nun and she talks about challenges and difficulties as opportunities for learning. So learning that to, to develop self-compassion and Dr. Paul Gilbert is someone people might like to look up and he does a lot of work. He has a few lectures on the web, on the internet on self-compassion. So really this is, if any of you watching are left with a lot of questions, well, that's part and parcel of <laughs> what we do because the more we know, the more we know we don't know or the more I know, the more I know I don't know. So I'd encourage anyone who's left with questions to follow up, either contact aware or contact your GP and really join in the conversation about responding to depression. Mm. So this is the end of the first part of the, the three session series. And then on Wednesday, we will have coping with depression with Dr. Keith Gaynor. And then depression and me, peace, people's personal perspectives. And mm. I love the privilege of talking to people who are experiencing depression and who are open and talking about their own experiences. Yes. Because we can ask them, Mm -hmm. what they found helpful and what when when family members and friends want them to feel better and in quotes be fixed how do they respond to that and what's helpful for them so Stephen Gurmila Mahogat thank you very very odd. much and um this is just lovely to do this and I look forward to meeting everyone on Wednesday and on Friday so thank that's it for now so thank you to Jamie and to Karen in the background mm -hmm.